Welcome to HEC TV's live interactive program that's part of St. Louis. The whole production is pulled together. It's going to be a steel bridge on the American classic novel. The car that put America on wheels. Welcome to HEC TV Live. Welcome to HEC TV Live for today's program, Earth Day, Building Green. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore, your host for HEC TV Live, and we're here at the international headquarters for Alvarisi Corporation with what is considered a preeminent green building, Leeds Platinum Certified, and we're gonna have the opportunity to talk about how this building was constructed and how they utilize all sorts of green ideas to make both the exterior of the building and the interior of the building a wonderful place to work. We're really glad that you're a part of our program today. As always with HEC TV Live, we're being joined by interactive pro schools throughout the program. And I'll be coming to you guys for questions throughout the program. I'll be announcing your school and asking you guys for questions. So be thinking about what you want to ask. For those of us who are joining us via television or the web, don't forget that you can email us questions all the time to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. We were here this morning and we talked a lot about exterior of the building, the site on which the building was constructed, how the exterior of the building works to make the whole place green. We're going to spend just a little bit of time on the exterior of the building this afternoon, and most of our time this afternoon is going to talk about the interior of the building. I want to begin by introducing John Alvarisi, chairman of the corporation. John, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It's Glad a real, real pleasure. Here. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the site, the space we are. We're outside, obviously, the front of your building. We can give everybody an aerial view of the, of the site as it looked beforehand. This actually was a building that was an industrial building that did what? We had a metal fabrication shop on the site when we bought the property. And they fabricated metal. They brought the material in by rail car, took it right out by forklift, fabricated it throughout the building, and then they took it out by truck through uh, either the uh, east or the north access and that was all paved area pretty much and we took all that paved area out and we built our building within the framework of the old warehouse building. So if people look at that old aerial image we just saw, you saw the building as a whole. Now if you go to the, the new building's aerial image, you're going to see from up above where we are now, you're going to see that open space right in the middle. Let's talk about the distinction. To our left is now your building garage, your parking garage. We have a structured parking garage, and it is within two of the bays of that old fabrication plant. Where we're standing now was one of those bays, but we took off the roof sections mm -hmm. and just left the structural support for it. And then the office occupies the other bay with the addition of those sawtooth sections which, uh, as we, we told the group, the group earlier this morning, added the space that we needed, but also changed the orientation of that side of the building. This side of the building was perfect for daylighting, mm -hmm. so that we get plenty of light and access to the outside. People can see the outside from their desks. But on the other side, it faced to the southwest. An afternoon sun really creates a glare, so we had that sawtooth pattern in order to present a solid wall to the Stop. west to take up that oh, glare and heat from the afternoon sun and open up the windows to true south so that we get the best daylighting without any of the penalty of the heat of the sun. And you guys are able to see that sawtooth, that sawtooth of the building because we're going to have a camera that's going to go out back so we can show you the sawtooth as well as some images that we've got. And I'll ask all of our groups who are joining us via interactive video conference to make sure you mute your microphones so that we're able to stay on the visual here. We're gonna be coming to each of you guys for questions throughout the program. So I'll ask each group to make sure we mute the microphones. I also wanna take this chance to introduce the two other guests who are gonna join us throughout the program and lead us around the building a little bit. So Grant and Christy, come on over. And Christy, I'll have you come to my left. Grant Lanham, furthest to my right operations specialist. Thanks, Grant, for being here. What does operations specialist mean exactly? I work for uh, Vertigy, which is our sustainable conser consulting firm with inside of Alberici, and uh, we help clients figure out how to build buildings like this all over the world, basically. Very cool. And to my left, Christy Cunningham Hi. Saylor, nice to meet you. environmental specialist. And as an environmental specialist, what do you get to do, Christy? 
the same, some of the same things that Grant does as an operations specialist, um, focusing on materials, um, some design strategies. Um, a lot of the, I guess the portion of my um, job is some education too, such as this, mm -hmm. um, and helping the rest of the um, company um, with questions that they might have as far as green. Cool. Well, most of our time today is going to be spent inside the building, but we wanted to give you all the opportunity to talk a little bit about the exterior as well. We've got a second camera in the back of the building, which is going to be able to show you that outside exterior that John was just referring to. You guys will notice the sawtooth side of the building. You're also going to see the prairie restoration project that's part of the back side. And you're also going to see the wind turbine that's part of that area. So we're going to take a little moment to let you guys just orient and look at that video. You see the sawtooth nature of the back side of the building, you see the prairie restoration project, and you see the wind turbine. And John, let's start just a little bit while they look at that video. Talk about why you decided to go prairie restoration, why you thought that was an important part of the process. Prairie restoration really recreates what was natural in this part of the country hundreds of years ago. The plants, the flowers that are out there have been thriving in this area for all that time. So when we put it in, it changed the nature of the grounds here. People can see just from the highway passing by that this is something very different from a normal lawn that you would see around commercial property. What we have, though, is a very efficient use of the property because the plants need no permanent irrigation system. So that saves on water usage. It also needs no chemicals or fertilizers. So we cut down on any additives which otherwise would be needed on a grass area. And we don't have the problem with any mechanized equipment coming in to mow it or take care of it because we only have to brush hog the area once a year to give the new growth a chance to get the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a, a very useful thing, but it's only once a year. So the only time we have to bring in equipment or increase our carbon footprint because of having that mechanized equipment is once a year. So it takes very little maintenance. It repropagates itself. You never have to replant it. And it's very easy on the environment because we don't have to use excess water or any other resources to deal with it. Very cool. We want to have the opportunity for you guys to begin to ask questions about uh, the exterior of the building. And we're going to be going to each of our student groups for basically one question at a time to be able to make that happen as we talk about the exterior. And then we'll begin to walk inside. So what is it you'd like to know about the building's side orientation, about how they came up with the sawtooth idea, about the wind turbine or the prairie restoration project or whatever the case may be. And we're going to start, we're going to start by going all the way up to Canada, East Northumberland and Ontario. Do you guys have a question right now for the exterior of the building, the side orientation, that kind of thing? Take it away. The, uh, how much does it cost? Oh, let's talk about, uh, that's a good first question to start with. Let's talk about the cost of the project and how those costs were reduced or changed to some extent because you reuse materials and that kind of thing. Okay. We started out thinking that we were going to do a very conventional project. It wasn't until after we acquired the property and really got the feel of what was here, we realized that there was an opportunity to do something very different here. But we had already, when we bought the property, arrived at the budget. We knew what things would cost in a building sense, but we hadn't decided to do the green until after we had set that budget. So we never changed it. Uh -huh. We just found ways that we could stay within the restrictions of the budget, yet do everything that we wanted as far as the green additions even with the wind turbine, even with other things that we did inside of the building and the exterior as well. So I think that if we had uh, consulted the experts, uh, they would have told us you can't do it for the same budget as a conventional building. But we didn't know that, so we went ahead and did it. Uh, I think that it's also important to understand that five years ago, we didn't have the range of materials to choose from. We didn't have all these strategies that we've learned about ever since then. We probably could have even done it for less money, but we did this for about $150 a square foot 
Now to put that in terms that people can relate to, Class A office space in Missouri cost between $130 and $170 at that time frame to build. Mm -hmm. So we were right at the midpoint of what cost would have been for a conventional building except that we got all of these green things added for the enjoyment of the people who were going to be in the building. And as some of you may have seen in advance with some of the prep materials we sent you, they had the opportunity to see some of those stories done about the construction, about how you use, reuse materials, obviously use the materials that were on site here to create the yes. building. And, and the trusses that we actually see up above us, that's all part of the original building structure. And it has to be, because even though it looks like two parallel buildings that are separated, the structure is really still just one building. And without the steel that you see here, it would not be able to support the garage mm -hmm. or the office. Very cool. I want to go to Van Buren Middle School in Tennessee. Van Buren, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Do you guys have a question now? Does anyone have any questions? We will hey, come back to you, Van Buren, as you come up with other questions you're interested in. How about Alan Roberts in New Jersey? Come on in, Alan Roberts. What would you like to know? How long did it take to make this building? How long did it take to make your building? Okay, but their question now is not about cost, but about length of time for the construction process. Yes. How long did it take to actually transform the space? We actually took more time in the planning because we had to learn a lot about green buildings. As I said, we hadn't done it. Our architect engineer hadn't done one of these buildings before. So we took extra time uh, 12, 14 months in order to do all of that planning. The actual project probably took 11 months, mm -hmm. and that's a little faster than what a normal building would be, but we had done all of that pre-planning, and that accelerated the process for the building. Very cool. I'm going to check to see if our other two interactive schools have been able to join in the bridge, and if you're there, guys, this will be your chance to ask your first question. Let's go to Stewart Place Elementary down in Texas. Stewart Place, are you guys in the bridge? And if so, come on and on, mute your microphone and ask a question if you've got one. I did. One second. What difference have you seen in your electricity bill? Oh, that's a great specific question. What difference have you seen in your electricity bill? I'll let you start to talk a little bit about that, Grant, sure. if you talk about energies and stuff. Has, has it changed because you've got the wind turbine and, the way, and the, just the nature of the way the building was constructed? Yeah, most definitely. Um, compared to our old building that we came from before we moved here, which was about 30,000, 40,000 square feet smaller than before. We are, electric bills are actually less here than they were at a smaller building. So we're saving between 75 and 80,000 dollars a year just on our electric bills since we've moved into here with all the energy saving features like the wind turbine, the better windows, the um, uh, air conditioning system that uses less energy, the ability to open the windows part of the year like we have today and let fresh air in instead of running the air conditioner. All those things have helped us save that large amount of electricity. And as we talk about the windows, this might be a good chance just for you guys to see the exterior of the building. You'll notice that down here on the ground level, you see some windows that we can actually open. And if you just are like in your office space or whatever and you feel the need for a breeze and you have the individual ability to do that. And then at the top of the building, you're going to see the buildings at the very top, the windows at the very top, which are Clara's Story windows, if I'm remembering to pronounce that correctly, uh, at the top of the building. And those open up automatically, right, Grant? Correct, yes. We have a weather station on the roof that monitors wind speed, temperature, humidity, those sort of things. And if it's in the right parameters, sort of like it would be at your house when you want the windows open, uh -huh. our building opens its own windows and turns off all of its own air conditioning systems. Oh, very cool. I hope the computer doesn't take over the operation, and, but that would be another story to tell. Let's go. Hunter Woods Elementary in Reston, Virginia, I want to go to you guys to see if you were able to join the interactive bridge and uh, ask your first question if you'd like to. How much energy do you need to run the building? <gasps> How much energy is needed to run? These are great questions, guys. Keep asking. How much energy is needed to run the building? Uh, well, right now, uh, in the middle of the day, we're probably using about uh, 150 kilowatts to run the lights, which is pretty low for a normal build, much lower than a normal building would be. And we're probably somewhere three to 500 kilowatts for the rest of the building, depending on what systems are on, how warm it is, those type of things. So we're about 30, 40% less, depending on the time of year, less than a normal building would be in this size. We're about to go inside now, but I want you guys to notice one other exterior thought here, and that is look at the windows now and notice how dark they are, how tinted they are. 
because we're going to see a little bit of difference with that when we go inside. So we'll move in and then we'll come back to your questions. Let's go on in. Thanks. So, Christy, I'll ask you a question as we begin to move in here and you talk about um, the, the nature of how decisions were made. As we walk here into the atrium area, the big office space, we see a building, a lot of people would think, my gosh, it was an old industrial warehouse-like building. It's going like, to look really unattractive when they decide to. <laughs> so, but it looks wonderful. So like, how did you guys think in terms of uh, utilizing materials that were like, really earth-friendly, the space that seems so industrial, and end up with a space that really looks so nice? Sure. Let me kind of step back from uh -huh. the question. We did pick earth-friendly materials, such as recycled carpet, bamboo, which is actually grass and grows um, fast. But also, the most sustainable material is one you don't have to use. It's also the cheapest um, because you don't have the transport or the harvesting, the transportation, manufacturing. And so, anywhere that we could find some way, way to use materials or an idea or strategy in more than one way, that would benefit our dollars. Uh, killing two birds with one stone, I guess, is um, a saying that might fit well. The, an example is a sawtooth. It uh -huh. adds daylight, but it gives us extra square footage. These atriums, they're a nice design feature. They break up the space um, because it is so big and expansive. They offer light through the office down to people kind of in the second, on the first floor in the middle, but they're also part of our heating and ventilation system, bringing the warm air up to the top. Um, so those were some of the ideas that were taken into consideration when choosing materials for the space. Very cool. Up above there on the second floor, which you guys can't see right now, that is where basically all the office space is and the conference rooms are for the most part. Those kinds of things are up above, right? Correct. This is what we're looking at right here is a firewall that, um, because the space is so big, earlier in the first show, John Abrisi said that we could fit close to two football fields into the space. Um, that it was before. And so the um, fire, the code official said you have to separate it. So we have the public side and then the private side where all the offices, both on the first and second floor. Very cool. And this is probably a good time for us to begin to talk about some of the materials that we used. Now this wall that's built back here, this is just, is this like regular like drywall or was this? Kind if you look up there, there is a special type of concrete block, uh -huh. um, AAC concrete. And what it is, they put fly ash in, and the process, it forms a chemical, um, a chemical compound, and it changes. So it adds air bubbles to it. So it gives it um, a lighter uh, capability. We can use um, equipment that it isn't so heavy. We could raise the, um, the blocks up and it also gives it a higher fire rating, but it's got a high recycled content and uh -huh. a waste product that normally we would put in the landfill, but here we've used it for uh, a building product. And Grant, there's something kind of cool about the nature of the carpet squares, right? Yeah, the carpet squares, um, they are individual squares, so that's nice. If something gets messed up, it's easy to replace just a little piece instead of the whole floor. They're also made from recycled soda pop bottles as well. It's a lot of, a lot of the content of the carpet itself. Just keep drinking that soda pop, kids, and then you can actually create carpeting for people. Let's see what questions you guys have. <laughs> so they can drink milk too. Let's see what questions you guys have about the materials that were used for construction. I'm going to go back to Bright Ontario again, East Northumberland. Do you guys have a question right now? Go right ahead. How often do they have to be replaced? Oh, in terms of any of these kinds of things, like the carpet tiles, etc., are they replaced fairly often, or is this a is this like pretty good durable? had to replace a couple of carpet tiles in the almost a little over five years we've been here so they're very durable um, the rest of the building is quite durable even though a lot of the products we use in the building even though they're very environmentally friendly are really not that out of the norm we mm -hmm. just use them in an interesting innovative sort of way and to our left there of these carpet tiles is this cork flooring what kind of floor yes, is that? Yes, that is uh, these, any of the, uh, we did it for some accent areas and any of the wet areas in the building, by drink stations, sinks, that sort of stuff. We put the cork so it's a little more durable than the carpet. It's not getting wet and getting stains on it all the time. Very cool. Let's and, go, and go cork, ahead, John. And the cork uh, can be peeled off the tree. They make it into layers, which we would put on the raised floor mm -hmm. uh, sections. And that can be harvested every nine years so that that, yeah, that is renewable. It's not uh, just a, a good product, it's a renewable product. 
when we talk about the carpet, it's also important that it has a very low VOC, the uh, volatile, volatile organic, organic compounds. compounds. And when you have those present in a carpet, you can always pick up that new carpet smell, mm -hmm. which is not really a good thing because that means that other things are coming out of the carpet that you're smelling, and it could be irritating to someone's system. With the new carpeting that is more earth friendly, those are very low so that you would not pick up a smell and it would not irritate any of the uh, people who work in the building. Very so good. it's a very friendly material to use both from the earth resources and from the health of the people who are in the building. Oh, very cool. Van Buren, let's go back to you guys in Tennessee. Another question from you. Okay. I ask, I ask us. I have a question. Um, how many pounds does it take to like renew the whole building? Oh, well, that's an interesting, uh, the question is about how many pounds does it take to renew the whole building, but let's think of it in terms of like, do you have a knowledge about like, with the amount of like, carpet squares you have here, you know, how many pop bottles were used or how many things weren't wasted for some of the stuff you did in the building, Krista, anything like that? That is a good question. You can take, uh, for um, the rating system we used, we documented uh, everything from the recycled content to the amount of bamboo, um, the adhesives, but overall in uh, an aggregate type uh, estimate I, I can't uh, give something close to that would you all be able to it would take us a while oh well that'll be something they'll try to figure out and maybe they'll be able to send us that information back <laughs> yes that's that, okay it's, that is a good question no one has ever asked that's a good new question to ask did you use color in any way to like absorb light reflect light those kinds of things uh, yeah I'll, <laughs> I'll mention if you look up on the the ceiling um, those conversations between the interior designers the architects the electrical engineers, those all happened when John spoke of in that design process very early on. We have a light colored ceiling so the light bounces up and then um, reflects and is distributed quite nicely throughout the space. Yeah, you guys will notice that the, the light bulbs actually shine up way more than they shine mm -hmm. down and the light bounces back. And that helps not only having a comfortable, occupant-friendly lighting strategy, but at the same time we can use, here in this facility, we've used about half of the lighting that a conventional building would. So we were able to save money on buying fixtures. Um, they're really energy efficient and um, at the same time work for us in more than one way. Well, and just the whole nature of all the windows, the natural light you were able to bring in. And Grant, this will probably be a chance for us to talk about those windows. From the outside, they look tinted and fairly dark. From the inside, though, uh, we can see out perfectly. What's the goal here? Yes, uh, the, the term for that is called the caving effect. If you've been in an older building with clear glass in it, you know, when you stand next to it and it's sunny outside, you can't see what the person looks like. And with a darker amount of tinting on the windows, you can actually see the person and it cuts the glare down. Mm -hmm. So our windows are tinted much darker than a lot of buildings are. It helps us with that uh, caving effect. It also makes it where we do not have to have as many lights in the building, man-made lighting, because without the glare, in the space, we don't have to counteract that with man-made ah. fluorescent fixtures in the uh -huh. building. It also helps with our energy bills quite a bit. That way, we don't have to bring in all that hot air and then spend the money to then air condition it back out later. Very cool. Stuart Place, let's go back to you guys for another question. Go ahead. Where, where will we find, like, the carpet, the recycled carpet? Can we buy it or is it just for businesses? Oh, that's a cool question because I believe that answer is certainly going to be yes. The question was, this kind of recycled carpet, can like individuals buy it for their home or is this like just a commercial grade thing? No, it is. This company that um, we bought the tiles from really revolutionized the um, carpet industry, I would say. They are very profitable. They are going to be carbon neutral in a couple of years. I can't tell you exactly the year that they estimate. They have reduced the amount of waste from their process. Um, amazing. And they also have a residential um, catalog. You can check it online. You can put it in your mud room, mm -hmm. in your bathrooms. Um, but the same idea, the tiles. So if you spill spaghetti or chocolate milk, you can take that up and you don't have to put a rug or move your couch over it. Very cool. Hunter Woods, let's go back to you guys in Virginia. Another question from you. Michael, 
Um, what kind of material did you use to make the roof? Was it was any special thing for it? That's a very cool question because we've got a, a slide image we can show you of the, of the roof. The, the question is about the roof. Uh, any kind of special materials that were used for the roof, but I notice when we look at this image, it's also white. Talk a little bit about the roof and the use of solar panels as well here. Uh, yeah, we went with a white roof strategy, uh, a cool roof, uh, that helps us basically with two things. It keeps the building cooler in the summer, sort of like a dark car versus a light colored car. Keeps it a lot cooler inside the building, so again, we don't have to spend as much money to air condition. It also helps with what's called uh, urban heat island effect. We're not absorbing all of that radiation all day from the sun and then reflecting it back out at night and making the space unnaturally warm. Uh, a good example of that is if you've ever watched the weather, a downtown urban area is usually four to five degrees warmer than an area out in the suburbs or out in the country. So the white roof does, helps us with that as well. Very cool. We want to give you the opportunity to see a little bit of that workstation space we referred to before. We've got some still images of the atrium view, so to speak, of the building. And we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to work here as we move to another part of the building at the same time. So John, talk a little bit about the, the nature of the building inside as they look at these images of you know, the office space being pretty wide open and, and that kind of thing. How did you guys think about making that space comfortable for people? It's a, it's a strategy that takes a lot of coordination because we have the desk areas that open to the views to the outside, but it also gives people enough privacy that they can do their work. We have a, a lot of sound absorbing materials that are part of the structure uh, of the desks and the uh, uh, walls that are uh, around, but they're very low so that people have the feeling that it is completely open and they're not in a cage, they're not walled in. It's very open. Now that's part of what we want people to feel in the building. We want people to make sure that they are coordinating with everyone else. So we want them in touch with people in their departments. We want it to be interactive. We don't want people walled off. We want them to share ideas, to do things together, to feel like they're part of the team. And it's hard when you have solid walls and when you have people cut off from others to have that very interactive feeling. So that was part of the strategy. The furniture that we have adds to that strategy. The open office design adds to it as well. So it's not thinking of it in terms of, let's get a desk, let's get the uh, distribution of communications, let's, let's do these things in a vacuum. No, you have to think of it as a system. And when you think of it as a system, how is it all going to work together? Just like how do the people in the company work together. And that is something that creates the kind of atmosphere in the building and within the work teams that create the synergy that we want. So the building itself conveys the way we want people to feel and act as a part of the company. Mm. Very cool. We moved into the cafeteria space where I'm very happy to say I had a really tasty lunch earlier myself. Um, it's a very green cafeteria, but before we talk about the cafeteria operation, I want us to notice part of the structural ideas we've talked about before. We're going to take the camera and pan to my right, and we're going to look at this trusses that we see here, the X's and stuff. This actually represents the, would I be right about that, John? This actually represents the end of the original building. This, this, was the, this was the outside wall of the original structure. And what we added was the series of sawtooths that would extend to the, west, uh, the south of the building. And as Andy pans around, we're going to see the windows over here to my left now. And you guys, this is actually part of the, one of the saw teeth, that's the yes. one, a tooth of the saw, um, that looks out on the Prairie Restoration Area where the cafeteria is, is located. And, and Christy, this cafeteria operation is pretty darn green. It is. Not only good, but <laughs> green. Um, we, when we moved here, we looked at having still providing a lunch for employees. We thought it was a good thing. Um, you can chat and collaborate, discuss with your um, coworkers, current projects. But at the same time, we thought, how can we... This is just way too important not to see. I'm going to stop yeah. you just a minute. Yeah. And we're going to see these fine employees. Yeah. 
uh, that's, recycling, as it were, as we exactly, talk about that, because that's, that's where Christy was going to begin to talk exactly about. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, at, at the point that at our old cafeteria, everybody used styrofoam, and say 100 people every um, day would eat and enjoy lunch, enjoy is the operative word, um, <laughs> you would throw away a bowl, a cup, a plate, some utensils, and times 100 people a day times five days a week, that adds up. And so we looked at not only changing our um, address, but the operations of the facility. Um, we purchased silverware, glasses, plates, everything ceramic. We throw away napkins, maybe cracker wrappers, straw wrappers, um, and that's about it. Very cool. And this gives us a chance also, and I want ask, Grant, I want to ask you about this, to talk about these nice little boxes I see hanging from the, the, the beams. And, 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 and now our camera person, Andy, is going like, okay, now what does Tim want me to, want me to show? We're going to go up and look at the, the white box there, which is part of your white noise system, Grant? Yeah, yeah. We, um, knowing we were going to have a very large open space with very few walls inside of it, uh, the strategy is to install a white noise system. What that does, it puts a little bit of static sounding in the background, kind of a mushy, staticky sound. And what that does, it takes all the individual conversations and kind of muddles them out and mushes them around a little bit, for lack of any scientific term. I like that one. But you can't hear individual conversations as you're walking through the building like you would if we didn't have that in the space. And I was really impressed by that. When we came and did a tour earlier, and we were up there in the atrium view that the students saw before where all the offices were. There were all sorts of people talking and working and everything, but it wasn't like I was in any way distracted by their conversation at all. So yeah. the system obviously works. It's interesting kind of scientifically to think that noise helps drown out noise, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, sort of like being next to a highway. Same, yeah. same sort of that yeah. thing. Yeah. Let's go back to student questions and see what you guys want to ask. East Northumberland, back to Canada. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Do you guys have solar panels? You, you. Look. Oh, you all have solar panels in the. Do you use solar energy in any way, shape, or form, John? We do, but it is not photovoltaic. It doesn't go directly from sunlight to energy, but rather we use it as a preheat system for the water. Mm. And that raises the temperature of the water so that we don't have to expend the energy then to physically raise the temperature for what we use within the building. So like for your dishwasher, when you have to have heated water, it's because of the solar panels? Th that is uh, something that we would have to add more heat okay. to, but for washing your hands mm -hmm. or for using that, it is perfectly warm enough to use just from the preheating that we do through the solar panels. Oh, very cool. Thanks, East Northumberland. Let's go to Van Buren again. Tennessee, another question from you guys. Okay, ask. How many pounds of trash do you expose of and, and, and how do you expose it? Oh, pounds of trash question. Very good, Christy. <laughs> about how much trash do you guys go through and deal with and what do you think the difference is potentially between what you produce and what you could be producing? That is, that's a good question. Grant might have to help me on that. We've talked about doing a waste audit, going and putting gloves and digging through and seeing what's compostable, what's recyclable, um, and room for improvement. But Grant, as the former facility manager, could say how much trash we had before versus here. And we had the same amount of people at our old office, too. Yeah, every, uh, to help talk about that, I'll talk about our recycling plan. Uh -huh. Everybody's desks has two receptacles at them, one for waste and one for white paper recycling. Also, all of our copy centers have a place to do white paper recycling. And then at seven or eight locations throughout the building, we have a place where you can recycle mixed containers, aluminum, plastic, glass, as um, well as battery collection. We recycle our batteries throughout the building. Oh, wow. So we have a recycling pickup three times a week and a trash pickup only twice a week now. So that is, uh, we actually send more recycling out of the building than we do trash. So oh, I, think that, cool. I think we're trending in the right direction that way. So. Excellent, great question. Let's go back to New Jersey. Uh, oh, wait, go right I, ahead, John. I would also add that it, you think of it, well, it's just a piece of paper that I'm throwing away, but I'll recycle it instead added up, it's an incredible amount. Across the United States, for instance, photocopies add up so mm. fast in business. We make, in the United States, 12,500 copies a second. Oh my goodness. Across the United States. And if you don't recycle those, they will just add up and fill up the landfills before you know it. 
Wow. And let me even go on to that. One like, more thought on this. <laughs> we take the cover sheets from our copy center. So uh -huh. we have main copy centers where you go in and you don't have individual printers. Um, we take those and donate them to schools, churches, so they can color on the backside. Uh -huh. So it's not even recycling from that point, but reusing, and then hopefully they recycle too. Reduce, reuse, recycle, yep. the three R's of, of being green. Uh, let's go back to New Jersey. A question from Robert Allen. From, pardon me, Alan Roberts, I just changed your name. How did you come up with your rain collector idea? Oh, where did the rain collector idea come from, Grant? Where did it come from? I'm not sure where it actually originated from. Um, it's interesting, right after we moved into the building, I was giving a tour to some people, uh, local people around the area, and I was talking about a rainwater collection system, and uh, a guy mentioned me, he's like, well, this isn't anything innovative. I've been collecting rainwater off my roof for 20 years at my house. Mm -hmm. You know, my grandfather did it before me. So it's an old idea. It's done more often, I think, on a residential level. Mm -hmm. We've taken it to a much, much larger, grander scale here and used that for all of our sewage conveyance. So, and just talk a little bit about how it works, because we've got a picture of the cistern yep. that they can see. Okay, well, the uh, parking garage roof, we collect all the water off of the parking garage roof and most of our rainwater goes into one of the two ponds that we have. The water off the garage roof actually goes into a 38,000 gallon tank that we've constructed. The water sets in there until we need it for the building. We uh, give it a little bit of chlorine and we filter it and then we bring it back to the building so then every time someone will flush the toilet here, they're using actually recycled rainwater for that. Very cool, very cool indeed. Let's go now to Stewart Place Elementary in Texas. Stewart Place, go right ahead. Does working in the green building Building influence the workers to go green. I don't, I don't, I don't think oh, Christy, this would be a great thing for you to talk about. Very cool question. Do you think working in a green building has influenced the people who work here to be more green in their own lives? I can I can tell you um, a story. Someone called me one day and they said, "This is going to be a weird question." <laughs> um, and I go, "Go ahead." And they had a fish at their desk, and they go. My beta fish has died. What do I do with it? Normally I would flush it, but would that ruin the water quality here? <laughs> and I said, well, I mean, what else? You could take it and throw it in the pond, and I mean, it's dead, so it's not going to reproduce and be a non-native species. And, and I said, well, go ahead. I, I don't know what else to do besides if we were to have a mini funeral outside. <laughs> um, but it, it forces people to think about the way they normally would have um, approach the the situation and kind of changing it and at least asking those questions is important I think I do think it has changed people um, their their everyday actions and do you think the space John to link to that do you think the space also has contributed to people's productivity oh absolutely because <clears throat> people just have a better feeling about being here now I don't know how you could actually measure the productivity. Uh, uh, did we get more projects? Did they put more work through? We can kind of see indices of that. However, what we decided that we could easily track was the absenteeism. How much time do they spend here as opposed to our old building? And we found that when we moved over here, the absentee rate went down 50 percent. Oh. That's now, pretty cool. That's that, pretty impressive. That is a lot. Now, people have asked me from time to time, well, is that because people are more healthy because they're in this building? Or is it because they just don't have as much reason to stay home because they like where they're working? And from my point of view, I don't care mm -hmm. because they're here. Now, I hope they are healthier, and I think over time they will be. But if that adds to their enthusiasm about being here, if that adds to their enjoyment of the building so that they're going to stay with us and not try to find work with someone else, that's great. And we try to enhance that experience so that they will feel better, be more productive, and be more satisfied with what they do. Very cool. Hunter Woods, let's go back to you guys in Virginia. A question. How much does this building pollute? How much does this, how much does this building pollute? Now, there's an interesting question. Do you guys have a comparison at all between new space and old space in terms of that? Uh, the space is much better. OK. Um, I guess you would have to equate that to how much energy we use. Uh -huh. um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we use 
a substantial amount less electricity than our old building used, even though we're much larger. We use much less gas as well. So the pollution coming from the power plants that had to produce those products, send them to us, is much reduced over what it was before. Uh, there's several of us here that ride our bikes to work, so we're polluting less. Uh, we're pretty well centrally located in town, mm -hmm. so that, I think, cuts down on some of the driving trips. We're close to the airport, so when visitors come to town, they don't have to drive as far. So some of those things we thought about that make it nice for our employees also make it nice because we don't pollute as much as well. So. And people don't leave the site because lunch is so good here, there's no reason to drive off exactly. and, and pollute and, yep. and eat elsewhere. Exactly. Great questions. We're going to move into our final space. We're going to see one of the meeting rooms in the building. And as we head that way, John, let's talk a little bit about some of the other initiatives you've done just in terms of green. You've got a gym here and all sorts of things, right? We have an exercise room and people can utilize that. In fact, uh, both the employees and their spouses can use it. They just have to take a class on how to use the equipment. So that's something where people can uh, utilize the facilities here instead of having to belong to a gym somewhere else. Uh, they can work out in times that are convenient for them. It might be before work, at lunch, after work, whatever is most uh, uh, convenient. But we also have other things like the, the, the learning center here, which is certainly something that, uh, that we didn't have in our old facility. So we enhance the ability to, to, for the organization to learn and to share knowledge within the organization. We even have outside groups that come in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have classes for other contractors, for emerging contractors, for minority contractors that uh, utilize this space. We have community groups that come in. We have groups that are just interested, for instance, in the prairie flowers, and they have classes here, and then they take people out to see what native planting is all about. So we have a lot of space that we thought through and we said it's going to be great for us but it's also going to be something we'll share with the community and that's important because we have a mission not only to be stewards of our own company but to be stewards of the environment and everyone that we come into contact with so I think again it's part of the strategy it's something that we care about, and our employees react to it because they feel better about where they work. If you feel better about these, the school that you're going to, you're going to be more loyal to the school, you're going to feel better about it. If you like the people that you're there at school with, you're going to do better work because it's all going to be fun instead of drudgery. Mm -hmm. I hope I it hope. is. And it's the same way with work. If you make it engaging, if you give people a great space to work in, they're going to react the same way in producing better work and more mm -hmm. satisfaction, again, mm -hmm. with what they're doing. Very cool. We wanted to bring you guys into this meeting room so you could see up close some of the stuff we were talking about in terms of materials before. And, and, and Grant, I'll just have you point to your left there. This is a bamboo countertop, right? Yes, it is. It's bamboo countertop, and it's perfectly yes. fine. And then is this cork? What's the front? What we got going here? Uh, this is wheat board. It's wheat made board. from 100% wheat product. Okay. Uh, so instead of grinding up wood and making it, gluing it together and making a board out of it, they grind up the uh, piece of the wheat plant that you can't use to make bread and other types of products with. They grind it up and make it into board product. And there's just... You don't use plastic bottles or anything like that, so we've got cups that we can reuse and we've yes. got mugs that we can reuse and you're standing right in front of the dishwasher that I could choose to run if I wanted to. Yep. And um, Grant, why do I have multiple um, <laughs> ways to get water here? It, it wasn't because we couldn't decide what we liked. Okay, I was going to say, this is a lovely faucet. <laughs> but <laughs> um, The lower faucet you see, the one that sticks further out, is regular city water, Okay. which is really good in St. Louis, but that's what that is. The other one, the taller with the... Uh, the more gooseneck on it, that is filtered water. Ah. We filter it at the sinks. Uh, every one of our public sinks uh, in the building have that. It allows us to not have to the need for plastic bottles in the building. Also, employees don't have to purchase bottled water in the building. This is the same quality they would get as if they were taking a bottle of water and then you know, having right. to recycle that, and that still wastes a lot of energy, even though it can be recycled. And then I see the difference between waste and recycled products right here. Yes. And so you guys are all good to go. 
And, and we wanted to say one of the most cool features, at least for me personally, uh, to close to the end of the program, that's to talk about your ventilation system and how the whole building is oriented um, to, to control temperature and that kind of thing. So in a moment, we're going to pull up part of the floor. But before we begin to pull up part of the floor so you can see underneath and see how the ventilation system works, I want to go back to those images we showed you before of those atrium office spaces. And let's talk a little bit because we've seen all those windows and we've seen the wall and talk about how the building's been designed to, by its nature, utilize you know, heat rising and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. to can help control temperature and people's quality of environment. Okay. Uh, Christy talked earlier about the atrium that we saw in the lobby. There's also two more of those throughout the space. So you can kind of think of them as big chimneys in the building. Everyone knows that hot air has heat air is heated, it wants to naturally rise up. So we said, let's not fight that in our building, let's let the air naturally rise up. So as the air, as we're in the space, as our computers are on, all those type of things are heating up the air in the building. So we heat it up, it naturally wants to rise to the ceiling, we let it do that. As it's rising, it picks up all the pollutants that are in the air and takes them to the top of the building. We have some fans that are gently drawing that air and exhaust it out the top. So our return system doesn't waste as much energy as a normal building does. Uh -huh. It just kind of lets physics take over and clean the building air out for us and help with the circulation of the air. Very cool. And we're going to go to the floor now, which may be hopefully fairly easy for uh, Jane to do on her camera to, to show us the floor. And we're going to see that, uh, and this is, this is true throughout the workspace, wherever you might happen to be, not just necessarily here. There's um, just these vents that are in the floor, and John... If I've got a vent like this at my workspace, and I can feel the air coming up now through it, I've got a napkin, don't worry, we're going to get a bigger breeze going here in a minute, folks. Um, but I can feel the air coming up through it. If I had hair on my head, you might actually see my hair move. Um, but if I wanted to, I could pick up the, the floor tile, John, if I didn't like it like where it was near my chair, and I could move the, the vent to another spot? Yes, and when we have the circular vents that are right by the people's offices, uh -huh. uh, or I should say workspaces, since we don't have permanent offices, they will be able to turn the top of the vent so that they can have more or less air depending on how much they want right at their workspace. If that workspace moves because we're reconfiguring an uh -huh. area, we're putting teams together that were different from what we had a month ago, we can just reconfigure where those vents come up, where people sit, because these uh, furniture units are modular. They do not attach to the floor and they can be moved to accommodate any reconfiguration that we want and rather quickly. And with the raised floor that we have, we also put all of the communications, all of the electrical connections, all of the piping, all of the air that comes through underneath the floor. And when you reconfigure something, it's very easy just to tap in change your source and reconfigure a space, which we've done in a weekend. And if you were facing oh solid walls and having to do things, it would take weeks to do it. So in essence, I don't want to call it a false floor, but the, the ventilation system is running underneath this floor, and you're bringing that air just naturally in from outdoors, or you have some motor that's running everything? We have a, uh, a fan system that uh -huh. will take it through, but the natural convection of the building helps to distribute that throughout the space. So those fans are very small. You notice that the air that's coming through is not blowing like mm -hmm. you would need in a top vented system. And the problem with that is, as we saw with the atrium, sometimes the ceiling can be 10 mm -hmm. meters away from the floor. So we really need to have a way to easily bring air into the building which passes from the floor through the space as a single pass. Very we cool. don't reuse that air, we don't blow it down through stale air toward where people will enjoy it, but rather we let it rise through the floor so that the mix of air is the freshest at about four feet above the floor, which is where We're people be sitting. sit or stand. And so that gives people uh -huh. the freshest air they could breathe. All the rest is vented out. We just use it once and then it is gone. Very cool. Grant, shall we try to pick up the floor piece? Sure. They've given us the suction cap, cup thing here, which you guys are going to have a chance to notice. And we'll bring up the floor just that easy. And you guys should be able to see fairly quickly that the napkin really begins to move. It's, 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 it's a fabulous, cool breeze that's, that's moving throughout the system. And it'll, whoops. Yeah, you're going to notice that it flies. That's how much, that's how much wind is coming up from the floor, and I, I do confetti and create a little uh, parade, but I don't want to create a mess for you guys down there. 
Um, this is probably a good time to, to go to each of our student groups for your last round of questions as well. So let's go back up to Canada. Uh, a question from East Northumberland. Are there any ge uh, geothermal technology being used in your building? Do you do anything geothermal wise? Uh, we investigated using a geothermal system uh, at the building and discovered that it was going to be very costly. Mm -hmm. So the payback model on that wasn't quite there for us. Uh, Going to have to drill a lot of wells. The, the rock structure here wasn't the best for that. So we went with a more conventional type system. But even though it's conventional components, we installed it and sequenced its operation in such a way to make it work very efficiently. Oh, very cool. Dixon, Tennessee, let's go to you guys. Pardon me. Van Buren Middle School, Tennessee. Dixon was here with us this morning. Van Buren, go ahead. Um, I have a question. Um, how much solar energy do y'all use per year? Oh, the amount of energy you guys use per year, kilowatt hours, that kind of thing, Christy, compared to previous location. And come on over this way for me. Sure. Um, I think she said solar energy, oh. right? Is that what she said? Um, solar energy, our hot water panels give us 95% of our hot water throughout the entire year. Um, so for our facility with the dishwasher, mm -hmm. um, washing hands, mm -hmm. we do have a shower for the gym. That's not bad, 95% of our hot water. I'd say that's pretty good. Yeah. I think that's very good. Let's go back to Alan Roberts again in New Jersey. Alan Roberts, a question from you guys. Uh, what, would, what would happen if the uh, water ever ran out of, uh, in, the, uh, in the rain collector? If there was a drought, what would happen to the rain collectors? Very good question. Ever had to worry about drought, not having enough water in the cistern? Normally we don't. We collect a lot of water from the garage roof um, and 30... 30 plus thousand gallons um, of water that we can use. Every once in a while, it might. Um, there were two summers ago that it was very dry. It's also hooked up to our public water system. So it's not like we have to ever not flush the toilets. Um, it just kind of switches over. And you haven't had to do that switch over very often? Once or twice. Very cool. And this is probably a nice time. Since you mentioned toilets, I'll just go ahead and ask yeah. you, Christy. You guys use, in some instances, like flush, no water urinals, and, 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 and you have a, a system depending upon how, the kind of toilet you want to use and stuff? Yes, we do. We have very water efficient fixtures, um, dual flush toilets. So you have one liquid waste and um, solid waste. And then in the men's restrooms, we have water free urinals, which use no water to flush. Um, uh, we have a cartridge that has um, a buoyant fluid so it holds the sewer gases and it doesn't smell in there. It's rather clean, yeah, it surprisingly. Is. Very cool. Stewart Place Elementary, let's go get back to you guys. Another question from you. Has your building um, made other people go green? Oh, do you think this building has helped influence other people to go green? John, come on over closer. Okay. Uh, with with Vertigy, and mm -hmm. we're represented here mm -hmm. with uh, some of the best and brightest of that company, uh, we try to share everything that we've learned from the green buildings that we have done for ourselves and that we're doing in the marketplace and really bring that to everyone that can use it. We, it, we don't just use it for our own construction, but rather we go out and we tell owners how they can do a project better, architect engineers, other contractors, anyone in the building process that has questions that wants to know more about the green strategy, we can help them. We have uh, uh, had very good success with our building at the time when we built it, it was judged to be the highest rated green building in the world. And others have raised the bar, but we just worked on a project, uh, Holy Wisdom Monastery in Madison, Wisconsin, and they got to 63 points on the lead scale, which is the highest rated building in the world now. So we've had the opportunity to participate in two buildings, which at the time, both five years mm -hmm. ago and just this year, became the greenest building. So we think that we have reset that bar each time and learned more each time so that we can help others go green and really take them to the furthest reaches they can have. Very cool. Hunter Woods Elementary, you guys get the final question of the day. And don't forget, folks, if you have more questions you didn't get to during the program, you can always email them to us at live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. But let's go back to Reston, your final question. 
What is your carbon footprint now, and what was it before you renovated the building? There, there are a lot of things to consider. Come on in, Christy. Um, sure. There are a lot of things to consider, and that is really tough. We've actually looked at what our prairie um, itself sinks as far as the carbon with the root structure. Um, as you know, prairie, prairie roots are very deep, sometimes double what, the, what we see on, um, on outside, out of the ground. But we looked at that, what that took, um, not mowing it, mm -hmm. only mowing it once a year versus if you had a traditional lawn once a week, what that carbon would be um, and petroleum input. But it's a really tough number to come and to get to. I'm sure that our corporation will have to do it someday, um, but it's determining those metrics are tough right now. And when you see how, how wide the footprint is, it's not just what we're doing in our own building. Usually when you talk about green buildings, uh, they're very much more efficient from an energy standpoint. They uh, have about a third less carbon that they emit. Uh, solid waste is probably down 70%. So we have a big input that uh, uh, green buildings can make to the ecology. But then it's also where we've been sited. We did not go out to a rural area and pave it over in order to build this structure. It's, it's at the center of the city. So we reduce the distance that all of our employees have to drive to get mm -hmm. here because it's centrally located. It has other advantages that we have like the covered parking and, and all of that which keeps people from having to run their air conditioners as much when they get in their cars in the summer so the effect of having the building is more far-reaching than the building itself it's the input that it would take for everything that it takes to run the building and we try to reduce that as well very impressive grant christy John, thanks so much for being with us and taking the opportunity for let everybody to go through your building this way. It's just phenomenal. We want to thank all the schools for joining us as well. And don't forget those web links we sent you as part of the prep materials on the CILC website give you some videos of what it was like to construct this building and the building operation. But I want to end with a little user-friendly moment because we've talked about these windows. And so if it was warm in here and I just wanted to open up the windows, all I basically have to do is this, and then I'm going to do this and this, and I'm just going to push them open and now I've got a nice breeze coming in. Just that simple. So in terms of an environment that's able to really think about uh, creating good air quality for people, reduce indoor air pollution problems, that kind of thing, it's definitely been created. And we, again, remember, compare what you're looking like outside this window, how glorious this outdoor area is, if I was having a meeting here to look out on. But when you look at it from the outside, what you're seeing is just that tinted window instead in that environment. As always, it's been a pleasure to be with you guys here as part of HEC TV Live. We look forward to connecting with you in the future. This program will be archived on HECTV.org and also on iTunes U for on-demand viewing at any time. And don't forget, you can always follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. It's been our pleasure to talk about or commemorate the 40th celebration of Earth Day with our program today, Building Green from Albarisi Constructors. Thanks again for being here. Bye, everybody. We're really glad you had such great questions. Thanks for being part of the program.